Among our American rivers, it would be hard to find one more overworked than the Ohio. Once, not even 200 years ago, this was the frontier. George Washington, traveling near here in 1770, remarked that the smallest of the Ohio catfish were bigger than any river fish near his home on the Potomac. There are no more 100-pound fish in the Ohio. Instead, the valley of this river today forms a great industrial empire, producing more wealth and supporting more millions of people than George Washington could ever have dreamed. All along the river's course, from Pittsburgh to its rendezvous with the Mississippi at Cairo, Illinois, the waters of the Ohio are used and reused countless times. A man competes against himself for the precious water, on his job for industrial water, at home for drinking water, and in his spare hours for recreation water. This competition begins where the river begins, at Pittsburgh. The Allegheny coming from the north and the Monongahela from the south meet to form the mighty Ohio. And here, too, big industry begins. Of course, in Pittsburgh, big industry means big steel. And that means water to cool the white-hot metal. Then for the water, back to the river with a load of scale, the top layer of the metal shorn off by the contrast in temperature and a form of pollution. But a river's for kids, too. Hey, you kids, don't you know better than to swim in there? That water's polluted. Now come on out of there before you get sick. Yes, the water's polluted. But Pittsburgh's success with steel has made it able to afford to do some cleaning up at a new treatment plant to take care of all domestic sewage from the city and 71 suburban towns, plus some of the industrial waste. Tunneled underground to this point, the human wastes, putrescent material from food processing plants, the grease and grit of a large American city are removed from the waters. More than a billion gallons of tainted refuse flow through this plant every week. In the processing, the water also receives doses of bacteria-killing chlorine, an added safeguard many communities can't afford. Treated sewage returns to the river. Most, but not all, of the disease potential has been removed. Just before it rejoins the Ohio, a laboratory makes one last check for bacteria and oxygen. There's an odor patrol, too, but you never know it. Just like those kids back in Pittsburgh, where the Ohio, one job complete, is moving on to West Virginia to help manufacture many comforts of man. Chemicals, machinery, concrete, glass, plastics, aluminum. And they all use lots of water. It takes about 10 gallons of water, for example, to refine one gallon of gasoline. Always borrowing the waters of the river, then returning the borrowed waters with man-made adulterants added mineral particles, mill scale, phenol, acids, oil slick, scum, slag. What effect do all these have on humans who drink them? We don't know. Some of this water, heated while in use, returns to the river still hot. This too is a form of pollution, thermal. Not exactly poisonous, but destructive to fish, plankton, and aquatic plants in the river, a boon only to undesirable green algae. Hi. Hi. Catching anything? No, this water's running the temperature from that new mill upstream. It's cooked every fish for miles. So I just keep kidding myself. <laughs> but I like a chance to sit and think. Well, good luck. Thanks. Well, all of us like to sit watching a river and think sometimes, but sometimes all there is to look at is suds, detergent suds. Chemically produced by ingenious man, they refuse to dissolve and they provide passenger service downstream for all sorts of bacteria. Hundreds of miles away, both will still be there in the water other Americans must drink. Water is the servant of man, and the wages of water are some effort toward repairing the damage wrought by man. The Ohio has a long way to go, and many people and places to serve. Coal mines, for example. Hanging Rock, Ohio. 
a mining company is repaying age-old debts to the river, cleaning house before moving on to a fresh location. This lake, once an open pit mine, has been backfilled, reforested, and allowed to fill up with fresh water. A big difference from the old days when abandoned coal mines looked like this, scarlet pools of sulfuric acid mine drainage. Acid that can corrode metal and concrete and the human stomach. But still possible to clean up. On the Ohio, the tug of war over the use of the water continues. People and industry, this time at Cincinnati, second great city and fourth major industrial center along the Ohio. Mill Creek, flowing through the center of the city. Not long ago, raw sewage also flowed through the heart of the city, in the waters of the creek. Today, underground sewers carry most, but not all, wastes to a treatment plant serving the metropolitan area. The results, incoming and outgoing liquid. This is the condition of the Ohio as it leaves Cincinnati. What about as it enters the city? To make the water acceptable for household drinking, cooking, and washing, water treatment plants have become a familiar part of urban scenery, not just along the Ohio, but in scores of American cities. The Ohio has now been through at least two major sewage treatment plants and hundreds of factories. If it's to keep up this pace, research to find better and hopefully cheaper ways to keep America's rivers clean must continue. Research at the new U.S. Public Health Sanitary Engineering Center is vital if our rivers are to serve a growing population and industrial plant. Cincinnati learned the hard way the importance of maintaining water quality along the river that is literally its life. In 1930 and 1931, severe outbreaks of intestinal disorders occurred in cities that used the river for drinking water. This floating laboratory, maintained by the city to keep constant check on the water, helps make sure it doesn't happen again. To enable the river to carry barges, to move the products of the river's industry, the Corps of Engineers began 50 years ago to build a series of locks and dams, transforming the river into a succession of long pools. It is a continuing project with new structures like this needed to replace outmoded smaller ones. Moving water, of course, can purify itself faster than still water. The Ohio today is mostly still, complicating the purity problems of those who must use it. Around Louisville, the saying is that the river is too thick to drink, too thin to plow. Louisville, home of the Kentucky Derby and of Kentucky bourbon. It takes good water to make good bourbon. The whiskey men can't depend on the Ohio. They use spring water. But the power company and the cement plant on the other side of the river and the farms downstream, they have to make do with the Ohio and add some more sediments of their own. Part of Louisville's water problem is a sewage problem. Beargrass Creek looks inviting up here in the bluegrass country. The trouble starts here as it begins its course through the center of Louisville. Just a large open sewer, uncovered, highly polluted. The concrete walls here keep people away, but a little farther on, as it meanders through Cherokee Park and past Daniel Boone, the creek looks innocent. Only a telltale odor gives it away. All the way through the downtown area of the city, collecting more refuse, garbage, and sewage every foot of the way, and those bubbles, not fish, methane gas, a byproduct of human and animal offal. Methane is a deadly poison. Back in the 1850s, when nobody had ever heard of water pollution, a whole string of slaughterhouses flourished along here. And so much blood flowed into the creek that the people of Louisville called it Old Crimson. Fortunately for the Ohio, these gates strained Old Crimson before it enters the river but straining doesn't do the whole job. How far below Louisville must the Ohio travel before regaining a reasonable part of its vitality and usefulness? 25 miles. 